Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Ann Kinseth. I'm the Director of Education, and it's lovely to see you again this Friday morning. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome back my colleague, Nancy Cohen Israel, for the final um, in her four-part Luis Martin series, uh, Siren Song. So welcome back, Nancy. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. And thank you all for being here this morning. Well, today, and are you going to get the lights? You've got the lights. Oh, awesome. Great. Thanks. So today is it. And I'm going to just talk about uh, two major institutions, certainly the Hispanic Society of America that we've been talking about a lot. I'll continue talking about Hunter Archer um, Huntington because he was such an interesting and influential man. And I would be completely remiss to talk about American collectors of Spanish art without discussing Alger Meadows. So we will be talking about him as well. And interestingly, there are, and there are huge differences between the two men and their institutions and also some major similarities. So we'll look at those today. Now, just once again, Archer Huntington's dates were 1877 to 1955. So he lived way past this period that we've been talking about. There was a question last week if Soroya did a portrait of him. If he did, it is lost to posterity because I have not found one anywhere, which is startling considering that Soroya painted everybody else's portraits, even people who were dead. So I don't know how they did not make that happen. But here I've got this one wonderful typical photograph of him at age 20, this very serious erudite young man, which he was, and a much later one from 1930, which I, I think he looks completely different. I don't know what it is, but there's something there's such a relaxed air and perhaps it's just the way it's painted. But every photograph you see of him, he looks like this very erudite young man. I can only think of the best examples, those of you who are fans of the movie A Room with a View, Cecil, Daniel Day Blue, Lewis's character, just like this very prim 19th century scholar. And that's exactly what he was. He was the son, again, of Collis Potter Huntington and Arabella Huntington. Collis made his fortune in shipbuilding in the railroad industry. And you know, when he died in 1900, he only had one heir, and that heir inherited $150 million in 1900, which translates to $3 billion today. So you can fulfill a couple of wish list items with that kind of money. And that's exactly what he did. He was incredibly, incredibly uh, generous and philanthropic. But I also want to talk about the milieu in which he was raised. So this was actually a second marriage for his mother, Arabella. And when she married Collis, she had the opportunity really to buy whatever she wanted. And so the home in which Huntington, Archer Huntington, was raised was on Fifth Avenue. Those of you who frequent Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue, that's where their home used to be. So if you want to get the Huntington energy, go into Tiffany's. But here are some of the works they collected. You know, a few paintings you may have heard of. Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer by Rembrandt and Vermeer's Girl with the Loot, both at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They also had Spanish paintings. Antonis Moore, who was the court artist to Philip II of, uh, this is the third Duke of Alba, depending on which side of the Netherlands Spanish equation you're on, was either a great hero or a horrible, awful monster. But it's something that Huntington grew up with, as well as this portrait by Juan Carreño de Miranda, Philip IV of Spain. And so he grew up with Spanish painting around him, along with everything else. I mean, his mom also collected work that was very fashionable at the time, the Barbie Zone artists, um, English painting, as we'll see momentarily. These portraits of Philip IV were really popular in America at the time. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I've never actually brought the image in. Henry Clay Frick bought this painting by Velasquez of Philip IV in 1911. And of course, it's now in the Frick collection. And those of you who frequent the museum may have enjoyed it last year when it came to visit us for its first trip outside of New York since 1911. But this, these images of Spanish royalty were very popular. Now, another question is, what are all these portraits of Spanish royalty and Spanish nobles doing in America? How did they get out of Spain? And that's something we're going to look at as well today. 
Now, interestingly, in sort of a move that is reminiscent of the Habsburgs, when Collis Huntington died, his wife Arabella remarried in 1922. And who did she remarry? Henry E. Huntington, her nephew. Again, a little too much influence of the Habsburgs, which is why now Henry Huntington moved to California in 1892. And so that was where, you know, anything that's called Huntington on the West Coast tends to be from Henry Huntington, which is why these two works by Thomas, or, uh, Thomas Gainsborough and Joshua Reynolds, which had been in that Fifth Avenue mansion, are now in California at the Huntington Library. So again, an interesting way that art gets moved around. Now, why Spain for young Archer? Well, his family had um, taken this trip to London in 1882. And while he was on this trip, he was reading the Zincali, which was a novel by George Burroughs. It had come out in 1841 about the Roma people in Spain. And so he became very interested and intrigued by this. While there, of course, he went to the National Gallery and he wrote in his journal, I wish I could live in a museum. So, I mean, he was a kid. That was really, really pre prescient. And what's ironic about that is unlike all these other people we've spoken about, Frick and Isabella Stewart Gardner and any number of other people, their mansions did become museums. And what distinguishes Archer Huntington from them is he never lived in his museum. It was built to be a museum. Now, on that trip, again, he was a child, he made his first acquisition, which were some rare coins. He made his first visit to Spain 10 years later in 1892, and he took with him a professor of Romance language from Yale University, Professor Knapp, because he was interested. He learned Arabic. He was multilingual, and he wanted to learn Spanish. He wanted to learn Spain from Spain, etc., he was so immersed in Spain and Spanish culture that by the time he was in his late 20s, he wrote a translation of El Cid, the great medieval masterpiece, as well as um, a critical edition of it. So he's been a he had been a scholar of Spanish art and literature forever. Now, to give you an idea, you know, his first real love were rare books and collecting books. And here's his library. So for those of us who feel like we've got a lot of books and, you know, anytime you move, they tend to multiply. His really did multiply. And he acquired them wherever he could. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, he had the funds to do so. And in 1902, he bought the whole collection of this man, the uh, Marquis of Jerez, which was huge and was a huge loss for Spanish arts and letters. And there was a huge outcry in Spain that this American uprooted this entire collection of works. Interestingly, that made a really profound impact on Huntington, and henceforth he decided, he determined that he was not going to buy art or manuscripts in Spain, only things that had already made it to Paris or London or the United States, because he already felt that his countrymen were despoiling the Spain and the Spanish cultural patrimony. So he made a pact with the king, Alfonso XIII, to say he was not taking anything out, anything else out. I also want to mention, in addition to the Hispanic Society, some other institutions that he endowed or made possible were the Mariners Museum in Newport News. And if you recall the, the portrait by Soroya of Thomas Fortune Ryan, that's where that one is. The University Art Museum at the University of Texas. So those of you who were at UT at a certain time, such as me, may remember the Archer M. Huntington Art Gallery. It's now the Jack Blanton Art Museum. And you may say, that is so random. He had an aunt who lived in San Marcos. So he donated the land. Somehow he had deed to the land and he donated the land for the University Art Museum, which you know at the time was on the far end of the campus, closer to the football stadium. He also had non-art interests. He supported, um, supported the American Num Numismatic Society, the American Geological Society, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and Brook Green's Garden in uh, South Carolina. So very, very philanthropic. 
But his true love was the institution he founded in New York in 1904, which is the Hispanic Society. It changed names when they renovated several years ago. So here you will see the Hispanic Society because that's what he founded. It opened its doors in 1908. This is what it looked like. Clearly, he spared no expense to make it look as Iberian as it could. And he had a very specific mission for this, which was the advancement of the study of Spanish and Portuguese languages, literature, and history, and advancement of the study of the countries wherein Spanish and Portuguese are or have been spoken languages. I mean, it sounds like a legal contract, but that's a huge part of the world. I mean, Spain touched and Portugal touched about everywhere. Interestingly enough, now we think of this as this great repository of Spanish painting, but when it opened, it only had 23 Spanish paintings. Everything else were manuscripts, book, um, maps, etc., different ephemera. So that was not how it was originally known. However, eventually it had work by El Greco, Velázquez, Ribera, Zurbaran, and Goya, as well as the work of contemporary artists, which we'll be looking at this evening. Another interesting point is that, you know, for all his wealth and all his erudition, mistakes got made. And in the beginning, he fell under the influence of some unscrupulous dealers. And so not everything was a masterpiece. Important data point as we go through. But what he found is that it was the artists, Raimundo de Madrazo, Beruete, even Soroya, who helped him find the really good material in of Spanish origin all over Europe. Now, the Hispanic Society, as I've mentioned before, is way up at 155th Street. It is on the former John James Audubon farm. So I don't know if birds still come there. It's built up quite a bit since then, but that was the, the origin of it. He was a big fan also of Ignacio Zaluaga for reasons that will make a lot of sense in a moment. Now, Zaluaga is not a household name. He should be. And actually, the first time I ever saw his work was at the Hispanic Society. And I came back and Nicole Atzbach, now blessed memory, but she was still our curator here and Scott Winterow was here. And I said, why don't we have any work by Zaluaga? And in fact, we did. And now we have even more, which is a great thing. But uh, so, uh, Huntington had eight works by Zaluaga, which is a lot. But when you consider that he had 260 works by Soroya, it kind of pales. One of the things that I think he really liked about Zaluaga's work, though, is that it was a real reference to Spain, sort of air quotes, this idea of Spain, this looking backwards of Spain at a time that was already disappearing. This is called The Family of the Gypsy Bullfighter. It's from 1908. I am fully aware that the term gypsy is no longer considered appropriate. However, this is the title of this painting, and they have not changed it yet. I'm sorry, it's from 1903. But Zuluaga, even for all of this Iberianness, had gone to Paris, just like everybody else, in the 1880s, when he was about 18 or 19 years old, and he spent five years there. He was very influenced by the symbolists, and so, you know, he was also aware of what was going on in the international art movement. He eventually went back to Seville, but kept going back to Paris on and off until World War I, really until about 1913. And in 1909, when Huntington invited Soroya to come to New York, he also invited Zuluaga. And Zuluaga just said, mm, mm, no, thank you. What's also interesting to me about Zuluaga, you know, that he's painting these sort of backwards, I don't want to say works that we're looking back in history. I don't want to say backwards looking, but things that we're looking to the past. His father was an armorer, somebody who made armor. And by the late 19th century, I can't even imagine how much business he had, considering armor was sort of, you know, out of style in the 17th century. But somehow this man was making a living making armor. And so it almost makes sense that his son would be interested in Spanish history and paintings, uh, looking back at Spanish history. His work did come to the United States. It was popular in the U.S. Voss Galleries in 1925 had an exhibition of his work. They brought 40 pieces and 22,000 people came to see it. So just out of curiosity, how many are you, of you non-docents are familiar with Zuluaga? Yeah, just a few. 
So I hope this will make you more interested in his work because I think it's beautiful. In the 1920s, the Spanish craze was back, which I find really interesting. You know, we tend to compartmentalize all of these things of art, history, politics. But <clears throat> in the late 19th century, we fought a war against Spain. We helped Cuba earn its freedom from Spain. And suddenly here we are just paying homage to everything Spanish. We also shouldn't forget that in 1918, 1919, there was another influenza pandemic called the Spanish flu, even though it originated in Kansas. So, um, so I think it's such an interesting dichotomy that on the one hand, you have these kind of negative connotations of Spain. And on the other hand, you have people like Huntington buying as much as he could. Now, the other people who really liked Zuluaga's works were the Americans who were still going to Spain. And let's just say, for example, that you're American, but you're lived in a place called La Cuesta Encantada, in a place called San Simeon, the Enchanted Hill, and you happen to be married to William Randolph Hearst, and you're living this whole Spanish lifestyle. Why have Sargent paint you when you can have Zuluaga painting you as a, Mar a Marquesa? And here we've got William, Mrs. William Randolph Hearst. This is a great painting. It's from 1923. And aside from the fact it's just so Spanish, and if it reminds you of El Greco, there's a reason. Zuluaga owned work by El Greco, so a lot of his backgrounds sort of have an El Greco feel to them. She's got this magnificent mantilla. And here's this is our Duchess of Arion. And if you see the Pineda, the, that big comb that holds the mantilla up, and if you look at Mrs. Hearst, I, I don't even know what this is. It's gigantic. It's shaped in a million different ways. But it's just so, there's something so American about her. She, she was an actress. She was 16 years old performing on Broadway when this stage door Johnny, who was 34, waited backstage for her. His name was William Randolph Hearst. And I mean, obviously, he brought her a life of luxury, which was great. And she lived in California. She had her paint, portrait painted. I imagine, I know our Duchess's dress is Balenciaga. I believe this one probably is as well with Mrs. Hurst. I don't know if we have devotees of Balenciaga. If, if you can say definitively, oh no, or oh yes. But anyhow, it's a designer gown. And this was right before, as I mentioned, they became estranged. So in 1925, they're living in California. They're living this beautiful, wonderful, very chic, very posh life. Except that the stage door Johnny never stopped going to the backstage door. And when he found another young, pretty actress, that sort of took care of this Mrs. William Randolph. Her, I'm sorry, William Randolph Hearst. So she moved to New York. And she lived her best life in New York because she still had a bank account. She could still live this wonderful life. But she continued to go by Mrs. Randolph Hearst. I'm sure it opened doors. I'm sure when she wanted a reservation at a restaurant, it was a lot easier to do that than to be Millicent Wilson. And, you know, she, again, as I said, she started supporting painters. She started supporting any number of causes. And this painting was actually a gift from her son to the Hispanic Society. Now, oh, before I finish sorry. with Zuluaga, there's another reason why Zuluaga, I think, may have fallen out of favor. And I know I just saw Lourdes in here a second ago. She's going to talk about this to our docents next week. But, you know, the Spanish Civil War took place in the 1930s. <clears throat> And Zuluaga sided with the nationalists. So I know it's a very confusing thing that the Republicans and the nationalists, it has nothing to do with, you know, Mitch McConnell Republicans. The Republicans were, I hate to call them freedom fighters, but they were the ones fighting against Franco. The nationalists were the ones on the side of Franco, which is where Zuluaga firmly placed himself. And he actually wrote to the wife of the American ambassador, Mrs. John Work Gar uh, Garrett, of the Francoists, we all will work with our, all our strength to rebuild a new Spain, free, great, and uplifted, to Spanishize Spain and get rid of all outside influences so that we can keep our great nature. 
I mean, seriously nationalistic. And so I think that that was probably part of the reason why his reputation may have um, fallen a bit. The other thing that's ironic and weird about the whole thing is that he was just stunned and appalled when Hitler invaded France. So uh, this would be somebody to bring back at a seance. But <laughs> even though we always think of Huntington, again, sort of this 19th century collector, he was also collecting contemporary art of the time. And I brought in this set of images to show you the work that he was buying and the work that we have in our own collection. So, for example, we he was buying the work of Santiago Rossignol in the 20s. You know, this is Segunda Day's End from 1901. We bought a work by him in 2020, 100 years later. So he's still looking at landscape artists, which is interesting, but he was looking at the more contemporary landscape artists. And, you know, I know we've got a lot of A-list artists at the Meadows Museum. I have yet to ever have anyone say to me, you've got work by Santiago Rossignol. So I'm hoping that maybe this will inspire all of you to go take a second look or maybe even a first look at some of the other wonderful early 20th century Spanish landscape artists that we've got. And another one, Juan Mir Trinset, who did the one on the left again in, um, is it the, in the Hispanic Museum and Library? And the one on the right is ours. Rarely seen, we don't have it out that much. But again, you know, he was finishing the loop. He was closing the loop of all of this. They were part of the Catalan modernist movement. And he also was collecting the work of Carlos Ubeda. And here you see the honeymoon from 1911, this kind of maximalist background with these wonderful costumes that this couple is wearing. And then our work that we just acquired last year, this beautiful, beautiful painting of Catalan police arresting a Romani couple that was based on an actual event that took place. It was very a very disturbing uh, situation. But you can see similarities. I mean, you can see just he had a very interest, strong interest in patterning and floral elements. And um, again, still representative, representational. We will probably having gallery talks or events surrounding our Ubeda, so keep a look, an eye out for those. And these, this period sort of effectively ended Huntington's big period of acquisition, which really went from about 1903 till somewhere in the early 1920s. He did, however, I know last time I kept referring visions of Spain, visions of Spain, and he did in 1910. He met with Soroya in Paris to discuss what they called the decoration of the Hispanic society. And he commissioned him, the original commission was supposed to be 29 large panels. They put it in writing that Soroy had five years to complete the commission. They put it in writing that if he died before those five years were up, his family would be paid a prorated fee for the work. They put it in writing that he would earn $150,000 for this commission, which again, a king, king's ransom. But this was something that Huntington had planned for his whole life because writing in his diary in, in 1898 on his first trip to Spain, he said, I wish to know Spain as Spain and express her in a museum. He also wanted to capture the soul of Spain in a museum. So this was his big chance to do that. And what he wanted, what they discussed, was that this would de depict the provinces, peasants, and cities of the peninsula. They were meant to be large. They were meant to be about three and a half meters by 70 meters. So for those of you who work in American measures of units of length, that's gigantic. It's about 11 and a half feet by 230 feet. That's a lot of paint. They sealed the deal when he came back to the exhibition for the exhibition in Chicago in 1911. They finalized everything. As part of that commission, Soroya was going to give Huntington all of the sketches and all of the costumes. And he was going to be able to retain the oil sketches. So the preparatory drawings are still at the Soroya Museum in Madrid and everything else is in New York. And 
they were also waiting to have the space to put them into because Huntington contacted his cousin, Charles Pratt Huntington, to build a reading room. And these were originally meant for a library in the, the Hispanic society. In the end, Soroya decided to do 14 panels. And in the end, they abandoned the idea of the reading room and the cousin built a West Wing exclusively for these paintings. This is the first of them that he finished. And so what I did is I'm, I'll show them to you sort of as the years he completed them, but they are enormous. As you can see, this is Castilla. I mean, it's 46 feet long. And even painting it a good clip, it took a long time. And all of them, of course, are 11 and a half feet tall. And so he made these pilgrimages to all these different parts of Spain. And he was painting the peasants. He was painting the costumes. He was painting the rituals. And both he and Huntington knew they were on borrowed time. They knew that these traditions were dying out. They knew that people were soon going to stop wearing their native dress. And they really wanted to immortalize it. He went to Andalusia. Here you've got the dance on the left and in a total, total contrast, Holy Week on the right. And yeah, for any of you who have been to any of these places and experienced these, whatever it is, either dance or Holy Week, you get a sense of the energy and the dynamism of it. In 1914, he was in Galicia in Northwestern Spain. And here you've got you know, these more caballeros, cowboy types. He was in Navarra in Catalonia. Uh, for also from 1914. So he's also chronically the dance that they were doing. He's chronicling any processions that they had. He was in Sevilla in 1915, painting bullfighting scenes. Of course, you're not going to have scenes of Spain, visions of Spain. It was actually the original commission was called the provinces of Spain. And at some point along the way, it got changed to visions of Spain. But you're not going to show anything about Spain without having, of course, a bullfight. And these uh, bullfighters are wearing the typical, the pink stockings, which is what they actually still wear, and the shoes and, um, you know, their entire uh, traje de luces, the outfits of light, the wardrobes of light. And then this one, Valencia from 1916. I think this is my favorite. I just think the light in here is amazing. And the oranges, you just feel the ripeness and the warmth of those oranges and the sun. And when people talk about sunny Spain, this is what they think of. Oh. Now, at this point, he wrote to Huntington to sort of give him a progress update to say, you know, what's going on? What do you think? This is where I am. And he never got an answer. And he was a little concerned, but it happened that Huntington was going through a divorce. He had been married to Helen Gates Chris for 22 years, and they were calling it quits. So he was a little preoccupied, which becomes a bit of a refrain for this series. We've got, but he continued, he kept painting. You know, he had, went to Palencia in 1917, where he painted Extremadura, so the western side of the country. FYI, this is where a lot of the conquistadors came from. So, you know, a lot of the Spanish that you hear in parts of Mexico have the same kind of inflection of Extremadura, because that's that's where who where they came from. This beautiful El Eche uh, from Andalusia. No, I'm sorry. Just uh, from 1918. Again, his use of light. They are very different, I think, from the beach scenes, but still. You know, and then you've got one more sea scene from 1919, Ayamonte, which is also quite enormous and magnificent. It was a long, long commission. I mean, they'd been talking about it for nine years. It took him five years to paint this. And when he finished, he wrote to Huntington and he said, I finished with the help of God, the commission that you gave me. It is all done after much suffering and pleasure. And you can imagine, I mean, this really kind of uh, held him up from doing a lot of other painting. Later in the year, he wrote to Huntington about installing it. Huntington said, please come to New York and help install it. He said, I'm not sure. And then unfortunately in 1920, 
he suffered a stroke in his garden and he never fully recovered. And three years later, he passed away. The work only shipped in 1920. There had been sort of a movement to see if it could be shown in Spain first. There were a lot of people who tried to make it happen for the work to be shown at the Prado, but part of the condition was that it would not be shown outside of New York before it was installed at the Hispanic Society. So in spite of their best efforts, it was packed up, it was sent to New York. And um, I'm sorry, it was sent to New York in 1922, accompanied by his son, Joaquin Jr., because of course the father was not able to join him. And at this point, again, the plans had changed. The original room was not the room it was going into. They were building a new room. And so the work just sort of languished a bit. And then, as I mentioned, Soroya died in 1923. In 1924, Arabella Huntington died, which was devastating for Archer. She had been his confidant. She had been his mentor. She had been such a rock for him. So this was a really big blow to, to Huntington. And he was getting remarried. So he had other things going on. The Soroya room only opened in 1926, if you can imagine, all those years later. Think of the art that was happening in 1926. And after all the success, you know, Huntington thought it was going to be 1909 again, and that 60,000 people were going to flock to see this. But the art world had moved on. So when this opened, it was kind of with just a big shrug, if you can imagine. I mean, Soroya gave all those years, all that energy, and nobody was particularly interested in it. Of course, not shortly thereafter, I mean, 10 years later, Spain was embroiled in its own civil war. We had all kinds of difficulties, to put it mildly, in this country that had been World War I. Three years after this was installed, the stock market crashed. Um, we had the Depression, we had World War II. I mean, there were all kinds of reasons that somehow scenes of sunny Spain were no longer of interest to people. But, you know, artists are great visionaries, and they tend to see things in a way that us mere mortals cannot. And finally, in 2007, well, people who are going to the Hispanic Society were seeing these paintings and just saying, wow. In 2007, they finally made their way to Spain. They were packed up. The Hispanic Society was renovating. They put them on tour in Spain for three years to a resounding, huge success. Everyone felt like they were coming home. Two million people went to go see these works in Spain. They broke every single record. And again, I will reiterate, if you've not seen them on your next trip to New York, definitely make it a priority to do so. We're not entirely finished with Huntington, however. Even though he had painted a lot of 19th century works, he was also very much a man of the 20th century. And dare I say, he was a bit of a feminist because he realized at some point, you know, I can't do this all myself. I'm not going to live forever. I need some help. So who did he hire? You know, at a time when Everybody who had these museums were gentlemen scholars, except for Isabella Stewart Gardner. She's a gentlewoman shopaholic. But um, he hired all these young women who had gotten newly minted librarian degrees from Bard, from Gallaudet, from all these universities. And they worked with his manuscripts. They worked with the library for a number of years. And then he said, listen, we need to make this a real museum. So we're going to divide this up into collections and we're going to decide who wants to take on which collection. And so they had departments that were paintings and drawing, sculpture, ceramics, textiles, prints and photographs, manuscripts, and rare books. And a lot of the treatises that these women, particularly on the textiles, wrote as late as the 1950s remain definitive texts on parts of this collection. So this was really an enormous contribution he made towards equity. The other thing that I alluded to was that he got remarried in 1924, and he married a sculptress, a woman by the name of Anna von Hyatt. And yes, I do believe it was from those Hyatts, that family. 
here she is, this portrait of her painted by another woman with the tools of her trade. She's got a mallet in one hand. You've got this wonderful banner behind her that looks very Spanish in the other. And that's really significant because what did she do for the plaza? You know, again, if you've been to the Hispanic society, you know, there's a gigantic plaza there, but she made a 16 foot equestrian bronze of El Cid that you see here. And you may recognize this from other parts of the world. The original one of this, the first cast went to Seville. There's this one in New York. There's one in Balboa Park. There's one in Buenos Aires, San Francisco, and Valencia. So the, it was part of an addition. But it was really, I think, very appropriate for her to choose El Cid, since that had been one of the things that really put Huntington on the scholarly map. And one of the things that enabled him to earn an honorary degree from Yale. She lived a good long life. She died in 1973 at the age of 97. And again, an artist whose work I hope we'll continue to hear more about. She also did the friezes. I couldn't find any images of them, but she loved animals. So there are these stone cut limestone friezes on the exterior of the Hispanic Society, the Hispanic Museum and Library. And those were all done by Anna Huntington. And <clears throat> Just to sort of recap what happened to Soroya and to how his reputation was revived, what happened in 1926 at the Hispanic Society was quite emblematic of just his reputation that, you know, it had sort of fallen on hard times for a variety of reasons. In this country, artistically, what was the earth shattering moment that happened in 1913? The Armory Show. The armory show that was dedicated to all that was new and modern and fresh. And this is where you, people, Americans, got to see all these avant-garde movements that were taking the world by storm and changing the way we saw things. So that was 1913. Soroya was still working on his visions of America at that time. It gives you an idea of the seismic shift. Shortly thereafter, as I mentioned, was World War I, stock market crash, depression, and World War II. And so it's during this time that Christina Domenic, writing in the current exhibition catalog, that you have what are known as the years of oblivion. And at this point, some of the families kept the paintings that their forebears had purchased in those heady years of 1909 and 1911. We have about 20 of those from original collections. Some people donated theirs to museums and others just sold them as, you know, they're cleaning out their parents' house and didn't know what to do with them. And um, so, you know, nobody had really heard much about him. And just to give you an idea, of, this is one that, of course, was donated to a museum. This is in our collection. And another one, Maria La Granja from 1907. And the reason why I wanted to bring this one in in particular was because in 1989, the IBM Gallery of Science and Art in New York put together the first Soroya exhibition in this country, really since 1911, the first big one. And it was meant to be on the, uh, the 80th anniversary of the 1909 exhibition. And it was called The Painter, Juan Soroya y Bastida. It continued to the St. Louis Art Museum, where he had shown in 1911, and then to the San Diego Museum of Art. And that's really important too. Because in case you ever wonder what all these weird numbers are, these accession numbers, how they get these. Here you see 1925 one. So the way you read an accession number is you've got the date and then the number. So this was 1920, the year it was bought or given 1925, the first one. What year do you think the San Diego Museum of Art would open? 1925, this was the first painting, the very first painting in their collection was by Soroya. Yeah, and this was here in 1907. Oh, I'm sorry, God, 2013. Uh, and of course it was a gift from Archer Huntington in memory of his mother in California where she had made her home. The date on this is 1907. Keep that, that date in mind. Again, Visions of Spain broke every record. Uh, there was a big Soroya exhibition in Ferrara and then Granada with 60 canvases in 2013, 2013, 2014. Of course, we had our big exhibition here that was 
in Dallas and San Diego and Madrid, featuring 160 works. If you remember that show, it was a blockbuster. It was phenomenal. In 2016, there was an exhibition, Soroya and the Paris Years, that was in Munich, which again was in place early in his career, Madrid and Giverny in France. And then in 19, uh, 2019, the National Gallery hosted Soroya, Master of Light. So suddenly he's become like the Van Gogh of Spanish painting. If you want to have a crowd, bring in Soroya. And, you know, I think we can all appreciate why that is. Now, what's going on? You know, there are a couple of artists who I haven't mentioned in relation to Huntington. And before I get to them, where did we talk about Soroya going and making all these contacts? What city in Europe that was important? Paris. Where was Raimundo Madrazo hanging out? Paris. Where was Martin Rico going? Paris. So... The artists you won't see in Huntington's collection are Pablo Picasso, Juan Gris, Salvador Dali, Juan Miro. And when somebody said, why don't you collect these contemporary Spanish artists' work? He said, they're too French. They've lived in France so long, they're too French. Which I think was the polite way of saying, I'm really not interested. I, and, you know, Picasso, maybe you could make the argument he spent a lot of time in France, but come on, Dali lived in Spain. So <laughs> there was no excuse there. However, there were still Americans who were buying work in, uh, buying the work of Spanish artists, such as Gertrude Stein, as you see here in this portrait that Picasso had done. And I brought in Les Demoiselles d'Avignon because it is from the same year as the last one we just saw. And it gives you this wonderful contrast of where Soroya was and where the art world was. Because here you've got Picasso, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, in which the picture plane is broken up, the figures, these full frontal nude figures that were influenced by women he saw in a brothel. I mean, it's night and day different. It was such a revolutionary painting that it even kind of scared Picasso. I mean, he didn't show it to too many people for a few years. They've got African masks at faces as faces, and the world was completely changing. But you had this American brother and sister, really, Gertrude and Leo Stein, living in Paris. They had come from like one of these golden age families who had spent years in Paris. Then they moved back to Oakland, California, where OG, her father, their father kind of built the railway and the, the streetcars there. And so they, again, you know, like Huntington could do pretty much whatever they wanted with the rest of their lives. And they moved to France and were supporting all of these artists. And then of course, Dali with this um, incredible portrait of Caress Crosby, which if you ever just want to be completely scandalized, read about Caress Crosby. Her given name was like Polly or something, but <clears throat> they want she and her husband wanted to give her a different name, which I don't think is ready for prime time. So they they sort of settled on caress here. But she served very much the same purpose as William Starkweather in that when the Dali uh, Gala and Salvador Dali were coming to America, not really knowing English, she made she alerted the media, and so when they got off the boat in New York. They were met by full press court of the Dalis are here. And so she really helped make his name in the United States. And I could talk a lot more about them, but I want to get to, to um, Alger Meadows. I did want to bring in, of course, our little Dali painting, which for the record is the only Dali painting in a public institution in the state of Texas. So with Mr. Meadows, this painting is a more contemporary painting. This was done in 2001. I don't know anything about the commission, but my guess is that it was completed for the opening of this building, which many of us, including myself, still consider the new building, even though we've been here for 20 years already. But here you see Mr. Meadows seated at his desk. He was born in Vidalia, Georgia. Unlike Huntington, he came from relatively humble, a relatively humble background worked very hard. At the age of 21, he became an accountant at Standard Oil Company in Shreveport, while also going to night school to earn his law degree. And at some point, he and a friend decided to break off and form their own company right after the stock market crashed. 
And so they did. So they created General American Oil. And um, they wanted to be where the action was. And so in 1930, they moved to where the action was, which was Dallas, Texas, which I think was a bit of different action then than it is now. But it was a good place to make a living and to make an impact. And they really thrived here, obviously. They became increasingly more and more successful. They expanded internationally. By 1959, they owned 3,000 oil wells. And so they, again, were very successful, as well as very philanthropic. Mr. Meadows and his first wife, Virginia, established the Meadows Foundation in 1948. So way before this museum was a glimmer in anybody's eye, the Meadows Foundation continues to provide us with a lot of support, as well as numerous institutions around the city. Their home was at 6601 Turtle Creek. When you see aerial pictures of it, like there was nothing there, but they had this huge Tudor home. And he decided that he would go looking for oil in Spain. And the joke we have at the museum is the only oil he really found were the oil paints at the Prado Museum. But he did so much to help the country rebuild after the Civil War that in 1963, he earned the Grand Cross of the Order of Civil Merit. And that is still here in the Founders Room along with this portrait. And so his collecting sort of happened by happenstance because he told Life Magazine, uh, I don't have a date on it, but he said, you're bored, you know, with nothing to do. And so you stroll over to the Prado and learn so much about each painter, which you can do because you're staying at the Ritz-Carlton, which is right across the street from the Prado. And he continued and he said, I remember when I saw a full page color reprodu reproduction of an American magazine on El Greco. And I thought to myself, with this type of display, he must be considered as the world's greatest. To me at the time, I thought I would give, it would give a certain elegance to a home, you know, old masters. Besides, it would be foolish to be around this great Prado Museum and not pick up some works by painters that they had that must still be there, right? Sure. So he also liked that in Spain, it was possible to get work for it that cost a little bit less. And so he engaged the services of a man named Jeronimo Sestos, who died in 1958, but passed Mr. Meadows along to his friend named Bernardino de Pentorba. And they started shopping and shopping and shopping and shopping. Unfortunately, in 1961, Virginia passed away. And he decided at that point that he was going to donate his collection, which was valued at $3 million in those days, to SMU, as well as a million dollars to build a place for it, which was built in the Owens Pine Arts Center. And I know many of us still remember that beautiful building. Here is the opening. And there are the gates. So we've got in this institution, the gates with these gates that were designed by Jack Alder of Theater 3 fame. And then in and the building opened in 1965. In 1962, he remarried. He married Elizabeth Meadows. And her interests were more in sculpture and French painting. And so when you wonder why we've got this sculpture plaza with artists such as Jacques Lipschitz um, and Rodin, that's why. Because it was two different collecting interests. We also know that the Dallas Times Herald at the time wrote that in keeping with the theme, Mrs. Meadows, this is Elizabeth Meadows, plans to wear a pink hostess gown designed by the Spanish designer Balenciaga. So we've got that fun fact in there. He finally hired, same just as Huntington, he realized you know, he needed help with this collection. He could not just manage this art. And so he hired his, the first director, who was this young PhD candidate named William Jordan. And nobody put their mark on this institution until Mark Roglan, I think, the way that Bill Jordan did. Bill Jordan looked, you know, to quote Soroya last week, looked at a lot of the work and thought, we have a fishy situation here. Because the work didn't all look like it was done by the people it said it was done by. So he brought in a team from the American, the Art Dealers Association of America, who came and looked at 58 paintings and delivered a lot of bad news. To say a lot of works were misattributed, a lot of works just were wrongly attributed, a lot were just fakes. And this was 
obviously not only a debacle, but completely humiliating for Meadows because this museum opened with such pomp and circumstance. And this was reported all over the world. It was in Life magazine. It was in Time magazine. It was in the New York Times. And it turned out that a lot of the work was by this Hungarian forger, very famous, very prominent forger named Elmer de Horry. But that did not do much for this collection, as you can imagine. Now, what was still authentic? I'm very happy to say those of you who know me know these are two of my favorite portraits in the whole museum. This pendant, these pendants by Juan Pantoya de la Cruz of the Archdukes. I just have to say to have the pendants, both of these is huge. Most institutions will have one or the other. And if you're lucky, there will be an exhibition where they finally get put together. We have both of them and it's from the beginning. And here you can see, I've got the accession numbers on all of these. So 1965, 33, the ones with the accession number of 65, I believe were the ones that came originally into the collection. And it's not that they were acquired. It's just the collection was, had accession numbers given to it. And then um, Jose Jimenez Aranda, the smokers. The reason we know the 19th century work is authentic is because this Pantorbo who was helping Mr. Meadows was the grandson of Aranda. So we knew for sure this was authentic. And of course the Soroya was also authentic. Now at the time, you know, needless to say, the international press was all over Mr. Meadows. Like, what do you think of this? I mean, what's he supposed to say? So he said on, for the record in Time Magazine, one thing I know, I'm no darn expert. You won't find me buying paintings ever again without the advice of a museum director. And then when asked what he planned to do with the works that he had already acquired, he said, I might build me a room on the side of the house in Dallas. It will be the my experience with fake paintings room. I'd add just one more picture, one of myself, and call it Mr. Sapp. So you've got to appreciate he had a sense of humor. And I don't know, did anyone here know Mr. Meadows? No, okay, because he, he only passed away in 1979, tragically, from injuries in a car accident. So I know there are plenty of people here who certainly remember, may have remembered him. But in the 60s and 70s, he and Bill Jordan set out to change the course. And the collection they put together is magnificent. They went to New York in 1967, where they acquired eight works. And I mean, these aren't like, you know, this little work on paper, that drawing or etching. These are like this Murillo, Jacob Lang, the peeled rods before uh, the flocks of Laban, which is a huge, very significant painting. If you look at this now, I invite you to also go upstairs and look at the print room where you will see the newly restored version of this. It was sent out to the Kimball recently before their Murillo exhibition, and it came back all fresh and clean for us. So it looks a lot different. On that same buying trip, they bought this portrait of Philip IV. So just like every other big collector, darn it, we've got our portrait of Philip IV. But I would argue we've got one of the most important portraits of Philip IV because when Velazquez was trying to become this, this you know, make his name in Seville, I'm, I'm sorry, in Madrid, he left Seville, there was a competition to paint a portrait of the new king. And the portrait of the king is the king, right? So if you've got a portrait of the king, it's like you've got the king with you. And of all the people who enter their portraits, the one that the king chose was this one that is in our collection. And so this became the template for all these full-length portraits of Philip IV. So this is a really important image or painting. The Zerberon also came from that shopping trip. He also got at that time these two wonderful paintings by Goya, Francisco Goya, that show very different periods in his career. The earlier, sort of more courtly 18th century portrait of Francisco Sabatini, and then Yard with Mad Men, which is a completely different image. I wanted to make them smaller because those of you who know this painting, you know, Yard with Mad Men is this teeny tiny little work. And of course the Sabatini portrait was a portrait commission. He also bought four pristine first editions of all four of Goya's major print series. Not only were they pristine, they had once belonged to the Duke of Lerma, who had been the advisor of Philip III, King Philip III. So an incredible provenance on that. Later in the year, 
he was buying more contemporary work. So again, when, you know, I think many of us, when we think of the Meadows Museum, we think of the portraits of the Philip IV, portraits of the Archdukes, portraits of the this noble, the Madonna, the Holy Family, etc. But the fact that Mr. Meadows was open to buying more contemporary work was also quite significant. And so here you've got his Gris, this landscape, and he didn't think that Gris was too French. He was happy to buy it. These two paintings by Miro that were selected by Miro himself for Mr. Meadows. Now, I know somebody's going to ask what the numbers mean. They mean nothing. Miro just liked them. He liked the graphic element to them. So for real, I mean, there's no hidden code in here. And these, um, again, came in in 1967. In 1969, they decided, you know, we've got to get rid of some of this work that's just sitting here that are fakes. And actually, our director of exhibition still calls some of these things are fagoyas. So <laughs> the goyas that aren't goyas. But a lot of them were deaccessioned. A lot of them were donated elsewhere. And then we also have a number that were kept to teach our students at SMU about connoisseurship. So they did teach, put that into a teaching moment. The other thing I just want to point out is, are these two um, works, sort of mid-century, early century works, but done at the same time by Picasso and Diego Rivera. And I just also want to make a quick note how lucky we are to have this Picasso. The Dallas Museum of Art does not own work by Picasso because at one point in their bylaws, they would not purchase anything, any art by somebody who was a communist or had communist leanings. And so that's how in 1969, the Meadows Museum ended up with a Picasso and the DMA did not. So, um, but what's also interesting about this pair, well, first of all, Diego Rivera is what nationality? Yeah, he's Mexican, he's not even Spanish. How, and so you might be up there saying, I didn't know Diego Rivera was Spanish, he's not. He was in Paris though, at the same time as Picasso and Gris and Brock and all of these other artists. And of course we think of Picasso with Brock all the time, but Brock left to fight in World War I in 1914. And at that point, Rivera, who had been in Paris since 1907, became very good friends with Picasso. And at this, this was sort of like this golden time in their friendship, 1915. And in 1916, they, uh, Picasso decided that Rivera was stealing his ideas and that severed the friend and he severed the friendship. And then of course we know Rivera went back to Mexico and the rest there is history. Now, the building, the collections have continued to grow. This building opened in 1921. Some of you may recognize some of the people here. We've got Linda Custard on the end, who with her husband, Bill, has done so much for this institution. Mayor Ron Kirk here, a very young President Turner. And when this building opened in 2001, the King, of Queen, King and Queen of Spain came. So just in conclusion, Mr. Meadows' vision of creating a Prado on the Prairie really has come to fruition. And with the newest opening of the Custard Institute of Spanish Art and, and Culture, the Siren Song of Spain will continue to sing in North Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand so I can bring you the microphone. Wow. Yep. Of course, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> if I recall correctly, there are some restrictions on what the museum can collect in the future. This museum? Yes. Okay, that I'm not privy to. I don't know. And do you know? No. Okay. Yeah. It's a good question. I'll ask I'll ask somebody else. <laughs> Nancy, a quick question. Yes. Sir. Um about two years ago, I suspect I went north uh to the Hispanic Society uh site and to my chagrin it was the octagon and the Saroyas was all locked up and closed. It was it was under renovation. Right. 
and I had the good fortune that the curator there, Marcus Burke, Marcus uh -huh, allowed me <laughs> to follow some, I think, uh, patrons uh, in a tour. And so I saw it. But it, it, is it open today? You it said? is open today. It has oh, reopened. It is. Okay. Yeah. That's all I wanted to know. Yes. So you can go see it. But a good thing to always check the hours because it's a long way to go to get there and find out that it's the day they're closed. Just curious, uh, what are the king and the queen doing there? Are they mixing the, the water? The king and the queen, yeah, I think they brought water from Spain. That's I don't, do you remember? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. So the Calatrava fountain, the wave that you see when you come in, was commissioned for this building. It was meant to be a wave to wave to students as they arrived on campus. And that's right, they poured the water into the, the Calatrava fountain. Thank you, Edith. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thank, Thank you Nancy. all. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you.